Wilmington's east side has a reputation as one of the toughest places in the city, plagued with poverty and violence. But city leaders are hoping a new outlet for young people in the east side could change that. In this week's first look, we visit the recently renovated Kirkwood Park to see how sport is helping revive the community. From abandoned, boarded-up homes to reports of shootings and violence, Wilmington's east side is a tough neighborhood. It's even tougher for young people who need a place to play. But now there's a great place to play at the nearby Kirkwood Street Park, a pair of pristine basketball courts paid for with $50,000 from the city of Wilmington. This is a major investment in this community, and we care about our children. While he didn't shoot any hoops, Mayor Dennis Williams did join the effort to cut the ribbon, opening two new basketball courts designed to give kids an alternative to the streets. And Darius and I, we talk about the times, you know, we were raised in the third district, things that were done, and we want to commit ourselves back to doing things for people in the third district and the entire city. The new courts have a slick surface and pro-style hoops. This one is like more, um, more NBA official because of the glass backboard, even though it's outside. Like you expect glass backboard to be inside a gym. City Councilman Darius Brown represents the 3rd District where the courts are located. We believe in building better neighborhoods and with that it is improving the quality of life of our residents and we firmly believe that that is building strong, uh, moral, good young people. And so a basketball court is a place where many of us, including myself, learn life lessons. Those life lessons are being taught to a new generation of Wilmington residents, mainly through the Silk Basketball League, which we'll call the new court's home. The league was founded in part by Jerron Droop Johnson in honor of his lifelong friend Terry Silk Alls, who died in a car crash a few years ago. He was thinking of a way to how we could keep his memory alive through things that we do, such as community service and mentorship. And uh, all of our number one love was basketball. So we decided to start a league. The league now includes 300 young players, but it's about much more than just basketball. Our volunteer coaches and mentors, we go beyond basketball once our season ends. We've been on parent-teacher conferences, field trips, uh, took kids to just general like life, life discussions, or just take them under your wing to show that it ain't just about basketball with us. We, we're a family. We try to bridge some gaps that otherwise ain't there. And it's been a long time coming for the league to come to its new home at this park. Actually, where we're standing at, we haven't. Nobody has probably stood here in about 12, 12 plus years. It's definitely a need uh, as an outlet for the youth because without the park, there was really nowhere to go. So that means idle minds can get into any, any and anything. So. Now that I'm now that we have the courts, I can get my forces out on the street. We can curve it a little bit. With the new courts and mentorship from the Silk League volunteers, Droop sees big changes on the horizon. It was rough at times, but through patience and diligence and conversation, it finally got done. And I know I know that's why the sun shining bright. Silk shining down on it, like the mission accomplished. We're going home. Years ago, one of the basketball courts was converted into a tennis court, although there was little demand for a tennis court in the community, and it went mostly unused. It should get much more use from basketball players in the neighborhood. And it was a little tricky to get the funding together to make the improvements at the park. Councilman Darius Brown said the money was pulled from other city projects that had unused funds left over from the past three years. So, Mark, what's it going to take to keep the courts in good condition? All right, because they're really nice courts, so they want to keep them nice. Mm -hmm. So the city's partnered with the Comores Company, uh, as part of their agreement to stay in the city of Wilmington and not relocate, Comores will send workers who will volunteer their time to keep the park clean and in good condition. Well, that works out. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Be sure to keep us posted on how the program evolves. And you can see video and read more about this project when you go to newsworks.org slash Delaware. Let's take a five-minute break from politics and bring in Barry Schlecker, who's putting on his hat as head of the Brandywine Festival of the Arts. He is our first person this week. Barry, welcome. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So let's get the basics out first. Date, location. Location, Brandywine Park. I always tell people, across from the Brandywine Zoo. Mm -hmm. Dates, September 10th and 11th. It's easier to remember. It's always the weekend after Labor Day. Okay. So there's a lot of people who come and display their works of art. Some of them have been displaying for over 20 years? 30, 40 years. Wow. The show's 55th year, started in 1961. We had one year empty, sort of mm -hmm. down, 
but theoretically 55 years, probably one of the oldest shows in the mid-Atlantic states. Yeah, that organizer just didn't pay some bills, it kind the, of... The last person, the promoter, right. uh, yes. And so you've brought it back? 2010, mm -hmm. it's my sixth year. And so this part of that bringing back the festival, you said you feature artists, is that right? Well, we want to revitalize the show and we wanted to honor some artists in Delaware who kept the show alive mm -hmm. and it helped me a lot getting it back. Last year, even though he doesn't show at the show, Tommy Burke, who has the great birdhouses mm -hmm. literally all over the country mm -hmm. and has national and international fame, I just thought he needed to be recognized. His, his birdhouses are probably too expensive to be sold anyplace. Mm -hmm. They're mostly custom made. But he was a supporter. He was a supporter and always called him. He always called me back. So he, we honored him the first year. Mm -hmm. This year, Larry Anderson, who's part of Delaware art mm -hmm. um, world, uh, who's sort of a, I call him a memory painter, because yeah. he paints those nostalgic scenes yeah. of us growing up in Wilmington, although he's originally from Chicago. Uh -huh. He captured some of those places. Like oh, Rehoboth, Chuck Wagon, yeah. uh, you know, the old- the Stone um, Balloon. The old Stone Balloon, yeah. yes. And even Deer Park, mm -hmm. but even uh, P.S. DuPont, Concord, Conrad High School, and, and even Market Street during the Wilmington Dry Good days. And so he has that wonderful art. And because the fountain's being repaired, he's going to put a, on the fence, put some of his works there, mm -hmm. but you have his usual two booths. But we're honoring him this year. So we know that you've helped bring the festival back. Is it sustainable now? I think it... I hate to say this, but it, <laughs> it sort of does, is sustainable. You know, we always have to worry about weather. It's, it's September, but we literally have about a hundred and half the artists seem to return, and the other half we are new. We try to have a mix of jewelers, mm -hmm. crafters, fine art, and this year we've really tried hard to bring in new young artists. So we have an emerging artist program. We we're invited. Not necessarily young people, people who have never done a big show before, mm -hmm. give them a break on price, hook them up with maybe a mentor, but bringing in some new people. And we yeah. have the next I, generation, right? The next generation. Now, hopefully, I'll be around to watch some of them. <laughs> but uh, we have 20, over 20, 25 emerging artists. Wow, that's very exciting. Yeah, it's fun. So we look around the arts and culture landscape in Delaware and, you know, wonder what the future of the arts will be. You think the, this new generation is it? It's great to come into Wilmington itself, see the mural program, see things like the Creative Vision Factory. Mm -hmm. You see the, the, the Delaware Contemporary, the Delaware Art Museum. Uh, it, it is alive and well. And there are 100 and some local artists that help me. Plus, we have about another 120 artists literally throughout the country who mm -hmm. come. It's, we're part of a circuit that people seem to end up here. Uh, people come in on Wednesday or Thursday, and we open up, we set up on Friday, and we open up Saturday and Sunday. I, I want to mention the zoo is also open mm -hmm. that weekend. It's only $1, and they have one of their business, busiest weekends ever. A lot of moving parts. Okay, thank you so much, Barry. Uh, the Brainwave Festival of the Arts is taking place the weekend after Labor Day. That's September 10th and the 11th. Good luck. And you can learn more at brandywinearts.com. First online is easy to find. Just go to whyy.org slash first. You can view this show whenever you want, and past shows can be found there as well. About 50 years ago, the world of children's literature was changed with the publishing of the iconic book, Where the Wild Things Are. The person responsible for that work was Maurice Sendak. A joint exhibit at both the Biggs Museum and the Dover Public Library showcases Sendak's work and talent through a traveling exhibit, making its only stop in the first state. And it's our first experience this week. <music> The exhibit is 50 Years, 50 Works, 50 Reasons. It's celebrating the life of the iconic author and illustrator Maurice Sendak. 2013 was the 50th anniversary of the publication of his iconic book, Where the Wild Things Are. Half of the exhibit is at the Dover Public Library and the other half is at the Biggs Museum of American Art.
Maurice Sendak grew up in Brooklyn. From a very early age, he was exhibiting this real interest in illustration. As a matter of fact, he was born the same year as Mickey Mouse's invention. It's said that his interest in illustration happened because he saw Fantasia. He either illustrated or illustrated and authored over 100 books over his career. Sendak was profoundly influenced by several tragedies in his own life, and he had the personal belief that it's okay for children to be afraid, and it really changed children's literature. It has a popularity beyond his lifetime. Children grew up reading that, and they have in turn read that to their children, so it really carries on. There seems to be a relevance in Maury Sendak's work that exists not only in the 1960s when he really came out on the scene, but then it's still in the 1970s. It's picked up again in the 1980s. His work was adapted for a musical, Really Rosy, with Carol King. On top of that, even within the last couple of years, Spike Jones made the feature-length film of Where the Wild Things Are. So now you're talking about like three and almost four generations that have been loving him and just sort of admiring him and passing him down generation after generation. Maurice Sendak's works really changed the whole genre of children's literature, honestly. And so bringing it into the library really just emphasizes that and really is another way for us to teach the public about Maurice Sendak. People just don't even realize how much they know about Maurice Sendak until they're here in the middle of the exhibition and all of a sudden they realize they've read half a dozen books to their kids and not even really realize that all of a sudden their life has been permeated by this one central literary figure. I really want people to sort of be grabbed by those characters, those really sort of iconic monster figures, Max in his crown and his pajamas. But I'm hoping that they'll start to understand the sort of breadth of Maurice Sendak's work. In terms of sort of American literary figures, especially in children's work, but you know, literature in general, he's a major figure of the 20th, now 21st century. Our goal is to celebrate the impact that he's had on all of our lives, but to also teach about Sendak's other works and illustrate, you know this story, but did you know the rest? And it's been wonderful to see people learning new things about someone who has been so important in their everyday life. Both the Biggs Museum and the Dover Public Library are located in downtown Dover, about a block apart. There are many different activities you can participate in around the exhibit, which runs now through September 11th. You can find more information on the web at doversendak.com. Next Friday, we'll show you the debate among the Democratic congressional candidates running for Delaware's lone seat in the U.S. House. Then on Saturday and Monday, we'll recap some of the big races that will be on the September 13th primary ballot. That debate Mark mentioned is Friday morning, September 9th at 8 a.m. It will be at Widener University and anyone is invited to attend. This is a project between WHYY and WDEL Radio. The debate will be heard live at 8 a.m. That is first for this week. We thank you so much for watching. For Shirley Men and Mark Eichmann, I'm Nichelle Polston. Have a great week. Oh yeah!